quickly. Huh? Everybody kind of silent. Uh, yeah, huh? okay. Huh? <laughs> yes, please. Uh, yeah. um, just a fact of observation. I was aware of all of, of my entire body, and that was my universe for all the time being. Okay. And yeah. my thoughts, which were analyzing what happened or might have happened, felt very foreign because that was now. Yeah. So when I managed to let go and, and achieve that stillness, it felt right. Okay. Yeah. So, and that was just by focusing on the body, basically, my line of body. Okay, mm -hmm. good. Yeah. Could you see the body kind of relaxing, and that's that's what's what happening oh, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very yeah. And then I just okay. Chest, Good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Often you can, you know, when you start off your meditation, you don't actually have to start very straight. People think that you have to sit really straight to meditate. Yeah. But actually, it's often the other way around. Often you start by slumping a little bit. Yeah. This is how I kind of start <laughs> meditating. Sit back, like, like not quite like that, but you know, I try to sit back, back a little bit, and. What happens is that if you really relax as you start out, uh, there comes a point when your mindfulness starts to become a bit stronger, uh, and then your body almost straightens up by itself. Mm -hmm. Because when the mindfulness is there, it is natural you want to sit straight because it enhances your ability to be mindful. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I I know some of the people I know who uh, meditate this, you know, all the monks and things like that who are incredibly good meditators. Uh, usually they start off by leaning back and kind of just really relaxing. Uh, because that's what you need initially. Uh, then the mindfulness arises, then you straighten up. Uh, getting these things in the right order actually matters enormously to be able to get the most out of the meditation uh, session. Uh, yeah. Good, uh, yeah? <laughs> Very good. Uh. Anyone else want to say anything? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Yeah. Um, well, if I notice uh, sort of blissful feeling arising, um, should I focus specifically on that or just... Have a, have a more general sort of open okay. attention. Okay, and the, the bliss comes while you are doing. doing sure, yeah. While you're doing what? What are you doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, are you just so starting off? Yeah. Um, really, as you're just following your guidance, really with compassion to especially the areas of difficulty. Yeah. And then yeah. Um, really sort of letting go, being more of a passenger, and noticing the experience. But then, and then yeah. a strong sort of bliss, or kind of like warm. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very woolly, kind of warm, soft feeling, or very kind of blissful. Okay. You know, difficulty may be located somewhere in the body, around in the chest, heart area. <coughs> um, and then, and then, uh, and then I guess that then, then that being sometimes like a stack of cards just collapses and the thought comes in, and then uh, starting again and kind of building up. But yeah. and then I'm wondering when that blissful feeling arises, you know, um, yeah. which I kind of feel like I'm not, I shouldn't really do anything, but I don't know, part of me is kind of, should I really focus on the, the, yeah, the yeah. blissful feeling or, or just kind of let it yeah. take its own course? I don't know. Uh, I, usually, the, you know, if you're already getting kind of uh, that happiness arising, usually your mindfulness is already quite good, yeah? Mm -hmm. you know, because usually if you are feel good in the present moment, uh, that's where the mind wants to be. So mindfulness is already rising. That's actually a very good, a very good sign. And Usually at that point, if you like to do breath meditation, because you have that happiness there already, it's a good time to kind of go to the breath mm -hmm. and then kind of conjoin that uh, positive feeling you have together with the breath. And mm -hmm. usually that develops the breath meditation very well if you, if you do that one. Okay. If you just stay with the feeling, it tends to kind of, okay, it stays there and then it kind of disappears again after a while. You need something mm -hmm. a bit more to hold on, not hold on to the wrong way, because you're not supposed to grasp these things, but uh, a bit more to focus on perhaps mm -hmm. uh, to then develop that feeling further. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so try that and see if that works. Yeah. In, in conjunction with, with, the with the breath, exactly. Yeah. yeah, so the breath, you know, the idea is to have to see the breath as something beautiful and positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that uh, that is what draws you to the meditation object. Yeah, when the mm -hmm. breath is nice, and if you're drawn to the breath, and then sustaining the attention becomes quite easy as a consequence. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. good. Yeah, great. That's wonderful. Huh? Yeah, did you want to say anything at the back there? Or? I was just going to say, what you just said about the breath meditation. Yeah, and I'm so used to sitting in meditation, following my breath. Yeah. I, I was a bit confused about Yeah, that. okay. Yeah. yeah. No, that, so yeah. Can you not just follow my breath, you can't just follow the breath. Yeah. But, you know, um, so it was completely new to me. Yeah. I didn't understand. Um, but, um, That's a good question. Know, and yeah. That's what I'm used to. Yeah. But, um, I just don't know if I'm not being attached to the breath. So yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, the reason why I don't usually focus on the breath uh, straight away is because if you read, uh, you know, the, particularly read, read how the Buddha explained how to do the breath meditation, uh, 
He always talks about, first of all, to establish mindfulness first. Yeah, this is the first thing you're supposed to do. And most people, when you sit down on the chair like that, your mindfulness is kind of all over the place. Your mind is a bit here, a bit there. Not always, but often it will be here. So because of that, take time to establish the mindfulness first. Only then are you really able to follow the breath. If your mind is not in the present moment, how are you going to be able to follow the breath then? Well, the only way is by using force. Uh, and if you use force, uh, then it's going to become uncomfortable very soon. Uh, and you're not going to be able to sustain the practice. Uh. So when you sit down, even if the breath is there, uh, and it's fine because the breath obviously is always there to some extent, uh, but don't really, don't worry too much about it. Let it be there, but start off by focusing on the body, by focusing on relaxing, by focusing on finding the ease. Uh, and then when the, you really find, you find yourself really relaxed and at ease, uh, and you're kind of enjoying the sitting here, yeah, enjoying the present moment, then when you go to the breath, you will find clarity, you will have the mindfulness, and the breath meditation actually starts to work as a consequence. So yeah, it's important to get the steps right. So even if the breath is kind of there in the background, don't focus on it initially. Wait till the mind is ready, then focus on the breath. And this is, I think, one of the big problems in meditation practice in so many places. You kind of sit down and you're told to watch the breath straight away, and actually it's not really in conformity with how this is taught uh, in, you know, by the Buddha in this famous sutta called the Anapanasati Sutta, which is a discourse on uh, mindful, uh, mindfulness of breathing in and out. Yeah. That's where I get my inspiration from, is going back to the discourses of the Buddha. That's where it all comes from. Yeah. Okay, anyone else want to say anything here? Yeah? No, everybody? No? Yes, please. Yeah? Yes? Yeah. And now, uh, so do you have to actually start from the head to toe observation? I, I find it useful when I listen to the sounds around me. Mm. That calms me down. Yeah. Because uh, most of the instructions are starting from the head to toe or the other way around. Yeah. So that, for yeah. me, I find it a bit stressful at times trying to concentrate. And, yeah. Uh, so yeah. listening to the sounds around you and trying to calm yourself down, does that? That is perfectly okay. Any, anything which works that makes you feel at, at ease and relaxed and lets your mindfulness arise. And sometimes the listening of the sounds, what, what you're doing is often just uh, allowing things to be. And when you allow things to be by doing nothing, well, that's what you hear. You hear sounds around you, or you uh, hear your thoughts, or you feel something in the body, or whatever. And as long as it leads to a calming down, which it will do if all you do is listen to the sound without judgment without trying to control it, without being irritated by it or whatever, you know, then you will calm down because you are withdrawing the doing, the activity. You know, that what gives energy to the mind ultimately. You know. So if it works for you, wonderful. Continue, continue that one. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I have been told the topic for tonight is the five hindrances. Is that what you're expecting to hear about? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Do you want to hear about that? Huh? <laughs> Okay, whatever, you're going to hear about it anyway, yeah? so you might as well want it, because <laughs> that's what we're going to talk about. So the, um, uh, just to, what I'm going to do first of all, this is to start off with a little overview of the Buddhist path, to kind of see how the five hindrances fit in to an overall picture, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about how to deal with them, how to uh, overcome these problems, because these are essentially the things that hinder us, hinder the meditation to progress, hinder both calm and also hinder insight or understanding yeah hindrances are basically the blockages on the path uh. and when you think about the buddhist path where what we're trying to do uh, we're trying to overcome dukkha yeah this is kind of the end of the buddhist path you overcome dukkha suffering yeah suffering is what we're trying to overcome and an alternative way of thinking about that some of people say oh this is really negative yeah I focus on dukkha all the time uh. but of course when you overcome dukkha or suffering uh, you also find the opposite you find sukkha you find happiness uh. So the Buddhist path really is about finding the highest happiness uh, that is potentially possible for a human being. Yeah. That is what it's about. Uh. Yeah, and when you kind of get that, uh, then you kind of you 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 know you uh, become interested in the Buddhist path. Well, at least you should do, in my opinion. Yeah, otherwise you <laughs> it's kind of silly if you not that kind of this is kind of the selling point. This is what it's all about. It's about moving towards happiness, uh. and of course this is what. Uh, life is all about. That's what everyone does. All we do in life is a movement towards happiness one way or another. Yeah, if you think about your life, uh, that's what it's all about. Yeah, when you choose your what to eat, when you choose what to wear, when you choose what to study, when you choose your, if you choose a religion at all, yeah, or you choose meditation or not, uh, 
everything we do in life is somehow to find satisfaction, completion, contentment, happiness, all of these things. So when someone comes along and says, well, actually, I've got the goods, yeah? Well, usually you say, okay, great, wonderful, marvelous, you know, that, well, is, it, is it really possible? And this is, uh, this is why, make, what to me makes Buddhism so extraordinarily attractive. It goes to the core of what uh, human desires are all about, what we're all trying to achieve. Uh, and when I understood that, and it took me a while to really kind of fully grasp what this teaching was about. I've been a monk for over 20 years now, uh, and uh, it took me a while to really kind of fully grasp what this actually means. Uh, and what it means is that uh, the uh, Buddhist really is about uh, the answer to the actual meaning of life itself. Uh, everything inside of us, the driving force, the desires, the craving, everything that makes us move at all uh, in life is this uh, search, this restless search for some kind of happiness and satisfaction in the world. Uh, and if somebody says that they have actually got that answer, uh, of course, it's going to be found slightly different place than where you think it's going to be found. But if they have the answer and they can make a good case that they actually have found it, you have found the answer to the meaning of life. So if you have found the answer to the meaning of life, are you going to go looking somewhere else? Are you going to say, yeah, yeah, whatever, I'm going to go this way? Or are you going to say, wait a minute, the answer to the meaning of life, which one are you going to do? If you really get that, you're going to, get, going to make you very interested. Yeah, You're not going to kind of, you uh, don't really need to search any further. And this is uh, where the commitment and the uh, perseverance and the, uh, all of these things to the Buddhist practice of meditation, but also much more broadly where that comes in. Uh. So I'm just now, I'm just selling Buddhism first of all, yes? I hope you don't mind that because uh, this is my job is to sell Buddhism as part of what I do for a, li for a living. Yeah, I guess, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, so this is what we want to do. We want to end suffering. Now, how do we end suffering here? Uh, how do we find the highest happiness uh, and uh, one of the critical things in Buddhism that uh, those of you who have been doing this for a while will know about uh, is that you have to see things in accordance with reality. Yeah? You have to see things as they actually are. This is kind of the, one of the critical things. And when the, that means basically having an insight into the nature, what it means to be a human being, what it means to be any being for that matter. Uh, so you need to see reality as it actually is. And when you think about it, it's actually very obvious that you have to see things in accordance with reality. Uh, if you are deluded, uh, if you've got all the wrong information, how are you going to find the right path to happiness? How are you going to be able to understand what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing? Uh, it's pretty obvious that you have to see things in the right way. Uh, otherwise, you're going to kind of get lost. You're going to go, you know, you think you shop, the, the shop, you're going to go for breakfast, uh, you're going to go down to the local cafe, you think it's there, but actually it's over there. Well, it always delusion, misinformation always leads to suffering because you never find that cafe. And you kind of get grumpy the rest of the day because you couldn't find a cafe. That's small, small stuff, but it kind of gives you an idea about why delusion and misunderstanding always is problematic. Yeah. So you want to see things in accordance with reality. This is what is called wisdom in Buddhism, uh, seeing things as they actually are. Uh. So how do we do that? Uh? And uh, one of the most important things to be able to see things in accordance with reality uh, is to overcome the, what is called of the defilements of the mind. Uh. Why? Because if the mind is defiled, it distorts our outlook. So if you have desires about things in the world, you have a vested interest in those things, and you can't see them for what they actually are. Yeah, if you are in a relationship and you desire the person you are in a relationship with, I hope you do, otherwise it's not going to be much of a relationship, so you, so you have some desire for that person. Um, so uh, then, uh, of course, uh, you have a vested interest in that. You're not going to be able to see that person as they actually are. Uh, you're going to treat that person differently from how you treat other people, precisely because you're in a relationship with them. Uh, so desire always leaves a vested interest. You cannot see things clearly. Uh, anger or ill will is even worse. Yeah? When you have ill will with, uh, about someone, uh, you can't see any, any good qualities in them. All you see is the negative stuff. Uh, so ill will also distorts your outlook very, very powerfully. Uh, so uh, this is why, uh, and these are kind of the two main hindrances, the two main problems in terms of defilements, uh, desire and ill will. Uh, you want to remove all of those defil dis defilements, uh, including delusion, which is really confusion or, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, and when those are removed, uh, then you have the potential for seeing things in accordance with the reality. Yeah? So this is, what, this is kind of the purpose of the path. Get to the end of all of these distortions and defilements and problems of the mind. Uh, this is what we're trying to do. Uh. So how do we get there? Uh? And this is what the Noble Eightfold Path is all about. Uh, coming to the end of all the defilements, uh, seeing things according to reality, and then finding happiness as a consequence. Uh. 
And the Noble Eightfold Path is a structured way of finding precise ways, gradual overcoming of the defilements of the mind, so we can see things in the right way here. And the Noble Eightfold Path, you probably know already, starts out with right view. Yes, that's the beginning of the Noble Path. You have to have some idea that where, where, what to do with your life. Then you have right intention or right aim or right uh, uh, purpose in life, whatever you want to call it. And then come the third, sec, third, fourth, and fifth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path, which are all about morality. Yeah, yeah the right speech, right action, and right livelihood are the three next factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. And this is where the process of purification starts. Morality is such an important, such an integral aspect of the Buddhist path. And if you are going to focus on one thing, if you're going to make one thing really important in your life, make morality very important, very significant, because that is going to lift your kind of whole ability to be mindful and to meditate and then to ultimately get rid of the defilements. And when we talk about morality in Buddhism, it is far broader than what we normally think about as morality in uh, Western culture. Yeah, morality normally in Western culture means don't do bad stuff. Yeah, don't do these things. You know, they, whatever. You, sometimes you can look at it in terms of the five uh, precepts. Yeah, you know about the five precepts. Yeah, five precepts. Yeah, but five precepts is a very narrow way of looking at morality. Yeah. Uh, especially from a Buddhist point of view, sila in Buddhism is far, far broader than that. Uh, so when we talk about right speech, uh, it doesn't just mean avoiding the bad things, uh, you know, saying nasty things to people or whatever, but actually it means developing kind speech. Uh, how can you say kind things to other people? Uh, how can you say a thing that goes to other people's heart? Uh, they feel happy when they hear you talking. Yeah, oh, please talk more. It's so nice to hear your voice. Uh, yeah, <laughs> that is kind of the idea of uh, it. And uh, when we do that, when we kind of combine the avoidance of doing the bad things uh, with doing good things, uh, that is when we're really purifying the Buddhist idea of sila or morality. Same thing with actions. Uh, it is not just avoiding the bad things, it's about uh, deliberately trying to support other people, do kind things, have de you know, deliberate compassion through our actions to others. Uh, can I get, get you a cup of tea here? Yeah. Uh, you know, what, whatever it is, two people you don't normally do it towards, maybe a colleague at work or whatever it is, somebody you just can normally just don't even see at your job, and you do something kind towards them there. And you develop this continuously, again and again, moment for moment, day in, day out, week in, week out, uh, over many years, and then it becomes a powerful force in your practice. Uh, and you start to feel really good about yourself. You, you start to feel this wholesomeness inside. You get this feeling that you, you know that you're living well. And when you know that you live well, you feel a sense of contentment when you close your eyes. The joy comes, the happiness comes, and then meditation takes off from that. And also, what is also happens when you live well in this way is that the defilements of the mind also are gradually start to be subdued. And the reason is because if you always try to be kind, it means that it's almost you're dragging your mind, kicking and screaming <laughs> along, yeah, because you, you can't, it's very difficult to be kind unless the mind has a positive perception of the person you're dealing with. Uh. So you can, the mind gradually changes its focus uh, simply by the fact that you are living well, you are kind, you are doing the, doing the right thing to people around you. Uh. So this is the beginning of purifying yourself, simply by living well, simply by being kind and avoiding the bad things in life. Yeah, so this purification already happening at this stage. And then we start to get to the really interesting things. And this is where we can start to talk about the five hindrances and these things. Because after the first five factors of the Noble Eightfold Path, we have right effort. And one of the main aspects of right effort is to overcome uh, the mental defilements, mental problems, uh, in particular the desires and aversions, the ill will, and the dis sensual desires for, uh, for things in the world, if you like. Uh, and this is where uh, this really starts to become important. Uh, and uh, this is one of the most important parts of the Buddhist path, uh, learning how to deal with your mind in such a way uh, that you get rid of these negative things uh, and you give rise to positive qualities instead. Uh, and the most important thing uh, to deal with uh, is ill will, uh, because ill will is very destructive. Uh, yeah, you know what it does to your relationships and to people around you. Uh, not only is it very destructive, but what I said is very blameworthy, uh, but it's also relatively easy to deal with. Uh, yeah? You can actually deal with ill will uh, uh, be because it is uh, unpleasant in the first place. Uh, there's a strong kind of motivation there to do something about it uh, and move away from it. And for that reason, 
it is not that hard to deal with ill will there. That's the good news, yeah? It is not that difficult. You just have to apply yourself properly here. Yeah? And then, as you do that, gradually your ill will will go down. You may already be a very good person. I'm not judging you in any way at all, of course. I'm just saying everybody has a little bit more ill will than they would like. Well, not maybe not absolutely everybody, but the vast, vast majority have that. We can always take it down one step, step further here to become even more even-minded and less uh, re uh, reacting less to the world around us. So, so how can we do this? And uh, one of the, uh, the Buddha gives some very powerful tools on how to deal with ill will, uh, how to see especially people around us in a different way, uh, because that is very often where ill will arises yeah, in people. Uh, relationships are often very fraught and very difficult. Uh, so that is where it starts. So how, how do we, what, what does the Buddha actually advise? Uh, and what he, one of the things, very important things that he advises is that uh, you learn to see the positive qualities in people around you. Huh? Yeah, the reason why you have ill will in the first place uh, is because you're focusing on the negative quality in somebody. Huh? Somebody does something bad and you straight away think, oh, you get upset and you get angry as a consequence because you're focusing on the negative quality. Huh? So the Buddha says all you have to do huh, is to focus on the good qualities in that person. Huh? And most people do have good qualities, yeah? Shift your focus away from the negative, move it on to the positive, and what happens? Bang, the ill will is gone. Simple. Yeah. Can you do it? <laughs> yeah, this is, and, and the reason you can't do it straight away is because it takes training. You actually need to build up that perception inside of you. You will notice that there are certain people in your, in your life that tend to irritate you more than others. Is that right? That, yeah, I think it's a pretty much a universal human experience. Certain people are more irritating, others are less irritating, some are kind of neutral, yeah? So take those people in your life that are, you find, most difficult to deal with, eh? and then ask yourself, do they have some powerful, good qualities? You've got to be honest now, yeah? You can't, you can't sort of kind of allow the ill will to overrule all good qualities. That's what it usually does, yeah? You don't, can't, don't want to see them because you have ill will towards them. Do they have some good qualities? And then once you start to focus on those good qualities, it's amazing. They start to appear. And the more you focus on them, the more you build it up into a perception in your mind, yeah, the more easy it is in the future when you see the ill will arise to shift over to that other perception. But you need to spend a bit of time just to build it up in your mind. And you can imagine yourself kind of filing that perception away in a little file inside of your mind, yeah. Uh, anti ill will perceptions file, you have to draw it, take it out, you've got kind of this person A, person B, uh, one after the other, and you have various perceptions that you then can use to overcome that. Uh. And the Buddha uses a very nice, he uses some very nice similes to explain how this works. Uh. And one of my favorite similes that he uses is he says that it is like a, a man who is weary uh, and, and hot uh, and scorched, yeah, uh, and is kind of wandering around and it comes to this pond. Uh, of course, the man who is weary and hot is the angry person. Yeah, if you are angry, kind of hot. Yeah, hot. That's why we call, say hot tempered because you are. Uh, it, it's a kind of heat there that comes with anger. Huh? But you're also thirsty. When you're thirsty, you're actually looking for a solution to the anger. Huh? You don't really want to be angry. You want to kind of overcome it. Huh? So you're thirsty. You come to this pond. Huh? Yeah, this pond uh, is a pond which is uh, has water, has algae and water plants on top. Huh? And the algae and water plants here, they symbolize the negative qualities that you see in another person. Huh? The water underneath, that's the good qualities in that person. Huh? So when you are hot from anger, what do you do? Huh? You come to this pond, this other person with negative qualities, huh? and you take away the water plants and the algae. You move it aside because you know <coughs> it is useless. You can't drink the water with all this algae on the surface. Huh? Sweep it away. And after you sweep it away, you drink up that water. Huh? And if the water symbolizes the good qualities, it means that you imbibe all those good qualities. You take them on board. And of course, once you have drunk it, then you have no choice but to carry it around with you. Yeah, at least for a while, you carry it around with you. The water goes inside, and then you feel uh, cool afterwards because the water cools you down. So this is what you do. All the rubbish, all the negative thoughts, sweep them aside. You don't want to see those. They, they are rubbish, they are pointless, they are bad. And instead, you take on board the good qualities, you drink those up, uh, and you carry them with you afterwards. It cools you down, it makes you feel better. Huh? So that this is a kind of the trick, yeah? Build up, see the good qualities, build those up in your mind, uh, so you have them ready. As soon as you start to feel a bit angry with somebody, pull them down from that shelf, 
focus on them and then the anger disappears and if you do it right the anger is gone like that yeah i mean really like that it's a very very powerful technique if you know how to apply it in the right way and this is far better than trying to suppress the anger yeah trying to kind of hold it down trying to do all of this kind of other things because that depletes your energy it doesn't really work anywhere as soon as you let go it comes back up again but this actually has the ability to completely eliminate the anger and it's completely gone huh? it's a very powerful uh, way of looking at other people but sometimes in life there are people we find that are so difficult uh, you can't really see any good qualities in them huh? yeah you make those people you can't see it doesn't mean that they haven't got any good qualities it means that you can't see them that's a big difference uh, but sometimes because of past history and because of all kinds of things, uh, sometimes it can be hard to see good qualities in other people. Huh? And when it is hard, what you have to do, you have to take another strategy. If there are no good qualities to focus on, uh, you have to learn a different way of dealing with uh, uh, people. Huh? And this is where the idea of compassion comes in. Huh? Yeah, and uh, the way uh, the Buddha explains this, and this is another simile that he uses, uh, he says it is as if you see a person uh, you see a person walking on a road, like in a desert somewhere, huh? and they are sick, they are ill, they got some terrible disease. Huh? But this is because they are in a desert, there's no doctors around, there's no medicine, there's nobody to look after them. Huh? Yeah. Huh? And when you see that person walking in a desert, sick and ill and feeling terrible, huh? how do you feel about them? Huh? You have compassion. Yeah. Because you, you think, well, poor, poor fellow, or, you know, poor, they are kind of walking here, there's no, nobody to look after them, they're sick because of no fault of their own. Huh? You naturally have a sense of compassion towards them. Huh? And the point is that if someone has all bad qualities, uh, from a Buddhist point of view, they are like a sick person. Huh? Yeah, they are deluded. They don't know what they're doing. If somebody goes around and does all kinds of bad stuff, talks in a bad way, acts in a bad way, thinks in a bad way, all they are doing is creating suffering for themselves. Uh, massively so. Really bad people, uh, which would do a lot of bad things, they suffer a lot as well, usually. Huh? Yeah, so you look at it and you think, you are so deluded. You think you are creating suffering, happiness for yourself. Everybody wants to be happy in life. Nobody wants to create suffering for themselves. You think you are living a life to create happiness, but actually all you're doing is creating suffering for yourself. You're completely deluded. You don't know what you're doing. Yeah. And of course, then what starts to happen when you realize that instead of focusing on what they are doing to you, that's when you get upset. You turn the table around and you look at them instead and you realize you are the one who has the problem. I don't have the problem. You are the one who is suffering. And you have it start to have a sense of compassion for that person instead of having a sense of ill will towards them. And it's very powerful because, uh, uh, you know, when you focus on yourself, when we look at ourselves and we kind of, uh, uh, it, it is a very narrow kind of thing. Yeah, looking after me. You know, and I, I, you know they are being bad against me and all these kind of things. Uh, it's a very narrow thing. Yeah. And your mind feels very constrained. You feel you live in your own little small world. Uh, but if instead you expand your mind out uh, and you let go of that self-concern uh, and you start to have compassion for the difficult people in the world, uh, your mind expands. Uh, your mind becomes far more beautiful as a consequence. Uh, yeah, you have compassion for the other person uh, and everything actually changes. The ill will is gone uh, and instead you have substituted a very positive and delightful quality instead. Uh, it is not so hard to do these things. Uh, maybe you think this sounds really, really hard. Actually, it is not so hard. Uh, the reason often why people think these things are hard is because uh, very often when somebody does something bad towards us, uh, we think it is, we take it personally. Huh? Yeah? We think it's them against me and kind of they are doing bad thing against me. And because we take it personally and because we feel they are doing it on purpose, uh, yeah, they're doing it purposely, bad thing against me, of course, that is why we get upset. Huh? But uh, one of the most powerful teachings of the Buddha, one of the most profound teachings, uh, and sometimes we can use these profound teachings to help us overcome these things, uh, is the teaching of non-self. Uh, yeah? And non-self really implies that we are not uh, entities, independent entities that function in the world apart from the worldly, all the conditions and, and phenomena in the world. Uh, but we are tied up. Uh, we are, in a sense, the sum total of all the conditions that have worked on us in this life, uh, and if you have, you know, an idea of past lives, and I personally, I, I don't have much doubt that there is past lives as well. All of these things coming together, yeah, that is who you are. You are not some independent entity that can stand apart from those causes and conditions and make independent decisions. So once you get that, yeah, that people really are, are 
uh, you know, a sum total of the cause and conditions that work on them. Uh, once you get that, uh, then when someone does something bad, you realize uh, that instead of being in charge of what they're doing, uh, they are the first victim of the cause and conditions that have worked on them. Uh, the reason they do bad things now is because of all the cause and conditions from the past. Uh, they don't have any choice. Uh, they have to do bad things. Uh, yeah, once you kind of get that, they have to do bad things, uh, even though it is bad for them, uh, even though it leads to their own suffering, uh, then you start to feel, then you really start to feel a sense of compassion, because you understand that they are their own worst enemy, and really, it, it, in a deep sense, it isn't even their own fault in a way. Uh. So this is how you turn things around, by using some of the profound teachings of the Buddha, in particular the idea of non-self. Uh. And... Um, one of the ways I like to think about it yeah, is I, 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 sometimes, you know, people, you, you come to a red traffic light, uh, yeah, and maybe you are in a hurry, you really have to get to this appointment or whatever it is, uh, and then just as you're kind of driving your car down the road, the traffic light goes red. Uh. So how do you react? Do you get irate? Do you start shouting at the traffic light? Do you get out of the car and kind of give the traffic light a good shake? Is that what you do? Uh? You, you might do it, but people think you are nuts, yeah? People think you're absolutely... You, you need to be locked up somewhere because this, this person really hasn't got a clue what they're doing. But the point is, in that situation, you are nuts. But if a person gets angry, does something bad towards you, you get angry in return, then people don't think you are nuts. But actually, it is a perfectly parallel situation. Because the red light, it goes, it goes red after a certain time, according to whatever electronic circuit is controlling it or whatever. And people are exactly the same, according to whatever conditions control us. You go red, yeah? Go red means you get, <laughs> you get a bit angry, so you go red after a while, and you do some, something bad. So when you think of people like traffic lights, sometimes they're green, sometimes they're red, sometimes they're yellow, that's so why we have to be careful. Yeah, it's going, oh, a person is going yellow. Okay, so then we have to be careful. And then you, uh, uh, you, you, you can't forgive, you can't let go, because you understand it's not personal. It never is personal. It's always about the other person being conditioned in this way, very incredible. You may think that I, may, I don't know what you think, yeah, but uh, uh, I'm very glad I don't know what you think, by the way. Because <laughs> maybe, what a burden to know what other people think. Yeah. But um, uh, uh, these are actually incredibly powerful techniques. Uh, and I have been using these kind of uh, contemplations for a long time, many, many years. Uh, and you can see that they work really well. Gradually, gradually, they kind of you start to feel more peaceful. Uh, you're less inclined towards the negative emotions. Uh, Sometimes you even feel positive towards other people, yeah? <laughs> That's really nice, feel positive towards other people. Yeah? So this kind of takes it down in this way. And it's very, these are very, very powerful things. Yeah? So, uh, uh, but, uh, of course, we are all slightly different, yeah? We all kind of have our, our own ways of dealing with uh, uh, these emotions. So if you have your own preferred way, which works for you, please use that. Don't just, don't just kind of copy me because, because of what I say, yeah? Uh, but these are just some ideas. And because they are spoken by the Buddha and the Buddha recommend them, usually there's a good, you know, uh, good basis for thinking that they will work pretty much for everyone. Uh, so that is how to deal with uh, uh, ill will and anger and negativity in the world. Uh, and this will take you a long, long way on the Buddhist path. Uh, I also want to talk uh, briefly about... Uh, 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 how to deal with desires, uh, because desires is another uh, important uh, part of the Buddhist path, but that's two uh, in, within the five hindrances. Uh, yeah, One of the interesting things about Buddhism is that nothing is really random. Uh, so when you have five hindrances, uh, they come in a certain sequence. Uh, yeah, And this, that sequence is always exactly the same. It starts off with desire, sensual desire, then you have ill will, uh, then you have tiredness and lethargy, then you have uh, restlessness and remorse, and then you have doubt is the fifth one. Uh, you know, you know your five hindrances? Uh, yeah, okay, good. So, interesting, the first one is sens sensory desire, the desire for the objects of the five senses. Uh, this is the first one. Uh, and the reason why it is first is because it is the most important one. Uh, very often, uh, uh, for example, sensory desire will lead you to ill will. If you can't satisfy some desire that you really are desperate to get satisfied, uh, you get angry, you get negative, you get aversion because of that. Uh, or if somebody treats you badly, often what that is, it's just a negative sensory impact that also makes you angry and upset. Yeah, so sensory desire is always connected with ill will. And this is kind of interesting because what that means, it means that all the sensual pleasures in the world, straight away they become less attractive because you know that if 
uh, you're going to pursue these things. Uh, ill will is just kind of uh, just around the corner, essentially. It always comes together as a pair. Yeah. Uh, so this is why this is the most fundamental of these five hindrances. Uh, and uh, I would say, if you look at the five hindrances, uh, the last three are very much a function of the first two. Uh, yeah, for example, if you get tired, it's often because you have been angry. If you are restless, it's because you have some desires. Uh, yeah, a desire drives you on. It makes you restless. It makes you agitated, all these kind of things. Uh, so of the five hindrances, the two you have to really deal with are the first two. Uh, yeah, that, those are the ones that are important. Uh, the last three, they kind of tend to get resolved as a consequence uh, of dealing with the first two. Uh, so I've just talked about uh, ill will. So what about uh, sensory desire here? I'm not going to talk too much about this, uh, but I'm going to give you a very nice simile that I always teach uh, when I teach. Uh, I've just been doing a retreat. Uh, I've just been teaching a retreat. We were off in the uh, Peak District National Park over here. Uh, we went to this really beautiful place. Uh, it's very nice over there, isn't it? Uh, it's uh, one of those things. Uh, this is my first time I'm in the kind of, what is this? This is the Midlands or the north of England? Midlands? Yeah, Midlands. Midlands. Okay. Mm -hmm. First time I'm in this part of England uh, and actually, it is. I, I read. I read it. I missed out. Yeah, it's so it's so beautiful over there. Yeah. And of course, the weather also very very beautiful. Everything was very nice. And we did a retreat. There. It's a wonderful place to have a Buddhist retreat yeah, because it was so peaceful and so uh, suitable for meditation practice. Really. Yeah. And there, like everywhere, whenever I teach a retreat, I always teach exactly the same thing. Yeah. So after a while, people say, "Oh no, not the same thing again. Why are you teaching the same thing?" So tonight, teaching exactly the same thing again. So for those of you who were on the retreat, uh, I'm sorry, but the same thing again. Those of you who weren't there, which is the majority anyway, uh, uh, maybe you will. Uh, maybe you have heard me on YouTube. Some of you, in that case, <laughs> problem again. Yeah, same kind of problems. So, so uh, but this is one of the, I think, one of the most powerful ways, at least initially, to understand sensual pleasures, sensual desires, sensual objects in particular, all the objects in the sensory world, and how to deal with that, how to think about it in a way that is conducive to reduction in desires and also to actually advancement of the spiritual path, uh, to improving meditation practice and all these kind of things. And this is a simile, the Buddha uses a simile of the borrowed goods. Yeah, and the Buddha says that uh, all the objects in the world, all the things that we can experience through the five senses, uh, anything we own in this life, our relationships, uh, whatever it is, whatever it is in this world that we kind of hold on to through the five senses, uh, that all of those things are like borrowed goods. Uh, yeah, we have we think that we own these things. Okay, this this is my belongings. That is my house. This is my mobile phone or whatever. Uh, yeah. Uh, whatever it is, uh, all of these things, this is my stuff. And we think that we are owners of these things. And if, if somebody else comes and steals it, uh, then we think they have taken what is ours. They have, it's, it's wrong. This is my stuff. Uh, you can't take it. Uh. But the Buddha says, what he says, he says that, uh, uh, he uses the symbol of the borrowed goods. He says, as if a rich person. Uh, and of course, this is the time of the Buddha. So the idea of being rich in those days was just a little bit different from what it is now. But anyway, he talks about the rich person. He has a chariot. In those days, you had chariots, yeah? drawn by horses or whatever, uh, and uh, actually not a rich person, an ordinary person, uh, and he borrows all of these nice things from someone who's wealthy, gets a chariot, gets all this nice jewelry or whatever, uh, yeah, and he kind of uh, drives around with this nice chariot, uh, thinking that he's important because now he's wealthy, but actually he's only borrowed those things. Uh, and after a while, once you kind of think that you are important and wealthy, it goes to your sense of self, it goes to your ego, it goes to your head, uh, yeah, you think, well, I'm really important. Uh, and then, uh, then when those people who actually own those things, they take them back, you feel that something, some of, an aspect of your identity has been taken away. Yeah, you feel suddenly you feel kind of naked almost because all of those things that you identified with, they are gone. Yeah, the simile of the borrowed goods, and the Buddha says that uh, everything, pretty much in this world, everything with so many of the things that we do in this world are just that; they are borrowed goods. Yeah, and it goes very deeply. I just mentioned before your possessions. That's actually very obvious why your possessions are borrowed goods. Uh, sometimes people steal things. Sometimes you're, uh, you know, you, uh, uh, in I, live, I live in Australia, and when we live in Australia, houses, people's houses burn down on a, on a regular basis. Uh, that's a bit of an exaggeration, not on a regular basis, but every now and again, somebody's house, house burns down, yeah? And people are so distraught. When you lose your entire home, most people are very are quite attached to the homes and all the content. Uh, it is very distressing. Uh, yeah, 
But to all of these things, you, when you see them burning down, you see, well, the Buddha said it was borrowed goods. What do you expect? Uh, yeah, it was borrowed. You have it for a while. Then you have to let it go. Uh. Relationships are notoriously unreliable. You are in a relationship, and before you know it, your partner leaves you. Uh. Or if they don't leave you, then they get sick or they die. Yeah, or you die, or whatever happens. Uh. It's always so uncertain, so unreliable. Our relationships are borrowed goods. Uh. So much of your identity, who do you take yourself to be here? Yeah, what, what, what your identity is about your position in your family. Yeah, uh, you're a son or a daughter, or a mother and a father, brother and sister, all these kind of things. Uh, it's about your education, uh, maybe about your social status. Uh, it's about all of these relationships, all these entangled relationships that we have with the world around us. Uh, yeah, so much of our mental sense of identity comes from that. Uh, one way or another, uh, including your political views and what religious views, all of these kind of things. Uh, that is also borrowed goods. Why? Because they belong to this world. Uh, your education has to do with this world. Uh, your social status has to do with this world. Uh, it's borrowed goods. Uh, and ultimately, your body, your own personal body, is also borrowed goods. Uh, all of these things belong to this world. Uh, sometimes many of these things, they disappear. You have to give them up before you die. Uh, at the very least, they're going to have to go when you die. Uh, so what the Buddha says is, well, if all of these things are borrowed goods, uh, how much are you going to invest in those borrowed goods? Uh, if you rent an apartment somewhere or a house somewhere, uh, and you know you're going to only have it for three or four months, uh, or whatever it is, uh, how much are you going to invest in that, uh, that apartment? Are you going to spend lots of money investing in it, painting it, making it really nice, uh, and then the beneficiary is actually the owner and not you, because you're going to have to leave again very soon. Uh, are you going to do that or are you going to say, well, I'm going to be here for three months, so I, you know, I'm just going to tell the owner to fix it up because it's his apartment. Uh, you know, there's a limit to how much effort, how much money, how much investment you're going to make into something which is temporary. Uh, yeah, it is obvious. Uh, so what the Buddha says is that life is exactly like that. Uh, but when you pass away, and this is where the idea of many lives, the idea of rebirth, uh, why it is such an important and significant part of the Buddhist teachings, uh, because when you move on into your future life, uh, what is it that you take with you? Uh, what is it that is not a borrowed good? Uh, and the one thing that you take with you as you move from one life into the next one is your mind, or the quality of your heart, if you like. Uh, yeah? These qualities that you have built up in this life, uh, your kindness, your store of generosity, uh, the uh, metta that you have towards others, the compassion you have towards others, uh, and even the wisdom that you have built up in this life, uh, that is what you take with you. Uh, so where, where should we invest our resources? Where should we invest our time? Where should we in, invest, uh, in, invest in this life? And it's fairly obvious that if you want to carry some happiness with you into the future life, yeah, not just being limited to this, this particular existence, you have to look at these things in a much broader, broader scope. You have to kind of stop just thinking about life at this narrow little slice of time and instead of seeing it as a broad massive thing and you have to invest on that long-term scale and then you are investing in the right way from buddhist point of view imagine if you come to your deathbed yeah you're on your deathbed you're about to pass away and all you have done is live your life for what is in this particular life all you have done is accumulate possessions accumulate relationships building up your status so you can feel that you have a big ego, built up your ego in a nice way. Actually, I wouldn't recommend that at all. I think it's a, it's a terrible thing to build up your ego too much. It just leads to more suffering and you become very vulnerable. That's what people do. Yeah, All of these things are built up. And all you do is invest in things that belong to this life. And then on your deathbed, yeah, and you're going to die. And you start to think, why? What's going on? You feel confused. I spent my whole life doing all of these things. Now I have to let it all go. What now? And you feel again, you feel completely naked, you feel abandoned because everything you have invested in has to have to be left behind. Your family, absolutely everything. And because all of these things were so important to you, very often you have also taken shortcut, shortcuts on the way. You have maybe uh, done some important <coughs> things, yeah? Because if your goal is always to uh, have material things to kind of have, be successful in terms of social status or whatever. If that is always your goal, that is the most important thing to you. Then of course you're also going to take shortcuts. You're going to do things that are unethical. You're going to do things that are bad. So not only have you are you going to have to leave everything behind when you die, but you have actually dragged yourself down, dragged your mind down, and you're actually worse off than when you started out before. So. 
what is the solution? And the solution is actually very simple. The solution is that when we live our lives with this larger perspective, uh, you realize that how you live your life is actually so important. Uh, yeah, instead of focusing always on the goals in life, the what's in life, uh, how much, and all these kinds of things, uh, you start to focus on the process itself, how to live. Uh, because when you focus on how to live, and if you start to live with kindness, uh, you start to live with compassion, you start to live with understanding and wisdom, uh, what is happening is that you're gradually transforming your mind, uh, and your mind is changing. And when eventually you come to your deathbed, instead of having dragged yourself down by living immoral, living in the bad way, you have lifted yourself up. Uh, your mind is lighter. Uh, you've cut off some of those things that hold you down, and you are soaring up, uh, feeling lighter, feeling bright, feeling happy about yourself. Uh, yeah, this is, what it's, this is what life is all about. And it's very simple to do this. The focus is only, you change your focus from focusing on the what in the world, all the goals, to focusing instead on the process, on the how to live. And when we focus on the how to live, the wonderful thing about that is that very often the goals come anyway. Yeah, because very often the people who are really appreciated in the world at the end of the day are the people who are kind, who are good. That's in my experience. And my experience is that those people I know who are the most successful in life, yeah, even successful professionally, yeah? very often they are people who care about their employees, they care about the people around them. Yeah? They are generally very good people. Yeah? And they are one of the reasons I think why they're successful is because nobody's afraid of them. They're not really competitive, they're not trying to get your job or anything like that. So you trust them, and that's why you allow them to advance, and they kind of they tend to kind of be lifted to the top. This idea that the most competitive people are the most successful, I don't think it's true. And even if they are successful, because they cut so many corners in getting there, they're actually not really successful in a personal sense. They're only successful in an external sense. And that is not really success at all. That's kind of rubbish success. So you do something else, and then if you turn out you're not successful, you don't reach your goals, or at the very least you have reached an inner goal. You've purified yourself, you've made yourself a better person. And then when you die, you have you are more pure. You have reduced the hindrances in the mind. They're coming back to the hindrances again. They're kind of been gradually eliminated. And you are more pure as a consequence. This, I think, is one of the most important things in life, to make this shift from focusing on goals, focusing on specific things that we want to achieve, and instead focus on the process. How we do things is far more important than what we actually achieve. Nothing wrong with achievements, uh, but the process is actually what, where it's really at. Uh, that is what makes the difference between a good life, uh, a life well lived, uh, and a life that is mer merely externally successful. Uh. And I heard a story, I, I, this was quite recently, we have uh, in our monastery in Perth, uh, we have new people coming in all the time, and we recently had a young American man coming into the monastery, uh, uh, and he told me the story that he had a friend or an acquaintance, probably, probably more the appropriate word, uh, and uh, this acquaintance, you know, one night they were kind of out together and this acquaintance were getting, was getting a bit drunk. And he said to this fellow who came to him, he said, well, you know, you're my best friend. And uh, my, my, this fellow who came, he was a bit shocked because he barely knew this guy. How can I be his best friend? You know, there's something completely wrong with this. And then he admitted to him, well, you know, I have, he kind of gave a little bit of his background. And he said that, uh, you know, I've been very <coughs> successful. I've worked really hard. I've made millions of dollars for myself. I could retire now if I wanted to. I don't have to do anything else. My friend said, well, why don't you retire then? I can't re retire. I, I need to work more. I need to just carry on. And then he it told him that on the way to becoming successful, on the way to becoming very wealthy, he had done so many dodgy things. He had done so many bad things. He had a kind of, uh, you know, tricked so many people out of their money or whatever, that he felt terrible about himself. Through the process of becoming externally successful, he had destroyed his inner life. Yeah, is that worth it? That's madness. Yeah, that your inner life is far more important than your external success. And this is the kind of thing that people often do, because we have got the completely the wrong values in, in the world, completely the wrong idea about what actually is important in life and what is completely uh, really, it's just an uh, uh, external show of actually doesn't mat matter at all at the end of the day. Huh? So by thinking like this, uh, and by choosing, prioritizing things in the right way, actually what happens is that your cravings uh, and your desires uh, and your uh, pursuit of the things of the world actually starts to drop already. Huh? 
These are wisdom reflections. Uh, these are ways of thinking about the world in such a way that you start to, uh, the, the desires, the defilements actually start to drop off. Uh, getting rid of sensual desire completely is actually very difficult uh, because it's a very deep-rooted thing and it seems like we're just enjoying ourselves in the world. Uh, why should we give up things that are enjoyable? Uh, and that is why it is quite hard to do. Uh, but when you start to thinking about it, things in this way, uh, they gradually they start to drop off uh, and these things become less important as a consequence. Uh, so this is the way to gradually overcome this particular hindrance. This is one way. There's many other ways of thinking about this. Uh, I'm, I'm going to just leave you with that one because uh, uh, it is a fairly easy one to comprehend. Uh, unless perhaps, you, you know, if you, of course, if you think the idea of rebirth is rubbish, uh, I'm sure there's someone here who thinks that because many people think it's rubbish. But if you, then of course, it doesn't have the same power to it. Uh, uh, but even then, it is the idea of dying in a peaceful, contented way, obviously, is a very positive thing regardless. Uh, this is just a simple way of dealing with sensuality or sensory uh, desires, at least a little bit. Uh, but the focus uh, for most people uh, in overcoming the defilements, uh, I think, should be on ill will, uh, anger, uh, irritation, these things, uh, because it's far more destructive uh, and far more easy to deal with. Uh. So as you live in this way, uh, uh, as you uh, practice in this way, uh, then over time you find that your mind gradually, gradually becomes purified. Uh. As your mind becomes purified, your mindfulness starts to arise. Uh. If you feel that you haven't got enough mindfulness in life, uh, it is not something that you just can do in meditation practice and then make mindfulness arise. Uh. The reason very often you haven't got enough mindfulness is simply because you haven't spent enough time overcoming these profound defilements of the mind. Uh. If you have... Uh, Desire, it means that your mind is going to be in the future. Yeah, desire is always about some desired future state. So your mind is going to be in the future rather be in the present. So you have to reduce those desires to allow mindfulness to arise. Ill will is often about the past. Your mind goes into the past because you have ill will against somebody, some person or whatever. So it makes your mind go into the past. So the more you overcome these defilements, uh, in daily life, by living well, by doing the right thing, uh, the more in the long term mindfulness is going to be established. Uh, this is a long term process. Uh, it's not something you can do just by sitting on your bottom and kind of watching the breath. Uh, it doesn't work like that. It's an integrated part. Uh, you have to integrate the spiritual practice uh, into your entire life, and then it starts to pay off. Uh, then things really start to work out. Uh, and then you come, you know, you go on a retreat or you do your meditation practice, uh, and then year. Year after year, you can feel something is happening inside of you. Uh, your mindfulness is getting established. Yeah, you may, maybe you felt that the breath meditation was always very difficult to do. Uh, almost everybody finds the breath meditation difficult initially, uh, and suddenly one day you get it. Uh, it's not that you get it; it's just that your mind is ready. Uh, and because your mind is ready, it is so easy. Uh, what could be more easy than watching your breath? Uh, yeah, you know what I mean? What, what, what is simpler in the world than just being with the breath? All you have to do is be here, yeah? the, and the breath is already, you, well, you already are in a sense, uh, and then there is the breath which is all, always with you. Uh, can't get much easier, simpler than that. Uh, and somehow we can't do it. And the reason we can't do it is not because it's difficult. Uh, people think if I get the technique right, then I will get the breath meditation right. But nothing to do with technique. It has all to do with whether your mind is ready or not. Uh, and this is what this is about. Getting your mind ready so the breath meditation can happen absolutely naturally. Uh, then it will happen all by itself. Uh. This is the right way, I think, to think about spiritual progress uh, and think about the spiritual path. Uh. And uh, then, of course, that is not the end of the path. But then, then you're already doing really, really well. Uh. Then once your meditation works, because your mindfulness is in place, uh, you keep on practicing mindfulness of the breath. Yeah, Maybe some other technique like metta, loving kindness meditation, whatever it is. Uh, and then you keep on purifying this uh, beyond what I've been talking about now until your mind is absolutely brilliantly clean and pure. Yeah, just marvelously pure. And then when that happens, that's where insight and all of these things come as a consequence of that. Uh, so, uh, there you are. That is a little bit about uh, the five hindrances, or at least a couple of them. I haven't talked about it. I left a few of them out. And an hour seems to have passed by already as a miracle. I don't know what happened to that hour. Uh, it's gone out. So uh, what I would uh, uh, like to open up for is any discussions or any questions you may have. Uh, and uh, you are welcome to ask about anything you like. It doesn't have to be about the topic tonight. Uh, 
uh, just to kind of broaden out the uh, broaden out things a little bit. Uh, I shall be more than happy to discuss pretty much anything. And if it isn't appropriate, then I will, of course, I will let you know. But you don't have to worry. Most things are usually perfectly within bounds. Uh, so anything you would like to talk about, about Buddhism or meditation practice, not politics, let's forget about politics. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'll be very, very pleased to talk about it. Uh. It's difficult to steer away from politics because a lot of my anger recently has been towards politicians mm. and individuals who happen to be presidents of the US. <laughs> <laughs> so you just get very hard yeah. to, um, to feel compassion towards people like that who you can see are having a negative effect yeah. on the yeah. world. Yeah, it's a very good point and I think many people probably struggle with these kind of things. Uh, so what you have to do is, you know, you have to understand that you know so whoever anyone is, regardless of how bad someone is or what kind of negative effect they have on the world, uh, they have been themselves been conditioned into that personality, yeah. And very often they can't do anything about it. Uh, Donald Trump is Donald Trump, and he has been conditioned into that. Uh, in one sense, it is appropriate to have a bit of compassion for him, because by being president, it's probably creating even more bad karma for himself, yeah. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to him when he dies, but it may not be very pleasant. Uh, yeah. So we don't we don't have to take that like, revenge. We can let Kamba look after the look after the revenge if you like. Yeah. We don't have to worry about that. Uh, and in a sense, you can have compassion for him if you wish. Uh. So and there are people in the world who you know uh, who are uh, even supportive of Donald Trump for whatever reason that they have. You know, obviously large numbers. Uh. So there's this. Uh, so you have to kind of broaden this out. And one of the things that I have, uh, you know, you find is that. Uh, uh, if you do this properly, it's almost you can almost forgive anyone. Uh, and I remember we had some in our monastery. We had a some a, a Jewish community in Perth. They have a school in Perth, uh, and every year they would come to our monastery to talk to us uh, with one of the kind of high school uh, students. Uh, and one of the teachers, it was a very very progressive Jewish man, uh, and he said that he had no problems with forgiving, you know, the Holocaust and Adolf Hitler and all that stuff. Uh, and uh, this was for similar reasons, because you understand these things happen according to certain cause and conditions, historical reasons or whatever. Uh, and uh, sometimes it is, uh, there's no point in holding on to the anger, uh, because the only person at the end that you are causing suffering for is really yourself. Yeah, you end up being angry, suffering. Uh, why should I cause myself to suffer? That's even more silly, isn't it, in the, in the end? Uh, so then you learn to let it go. You know, to take a different approach to it uh, and look at it in a different way. Uh. It is not that hard, actually. This is kind of the astonishing thing here. One thing to do is to watch less news as well. Huh? Yeah, I recommend that. Huh? Yeah, because sometimes you see the same rubbish night after night. You want to do, I really need to see this. Actually, probably not. Huh? And uh, so uh, it is, uh, it, yeah, it's kind of all, the plot is often exactly the same, night, day after day on the news, and sometimes the actors change a little bit, but the plot pretty much the same. So uh, you can kind of let go of that. Huh? Yes. Uh, so, uh, okay. Uh, you know what the Buddha said? He said that when you ask questions, you become wise in your future life. You're aware of that? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of the thing. Maybe I, sh I should ask you some questions and see what happens. <laughs> uh, how many of you have any feeling about rebirth? Are, are, are you? Are, is, any, is everyone here kind of really? Yeah. Jack, I was going to ask yeah? you a question. About yeah, please uh, go for it. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I'm not. You don't practice, okay? Yeah. No, okay. Yeah. You do practice something, right? You're, you're still breathing. So you must practice something. Yeah. yeah. Just now, when we were sitting at the start, I've been racing down the motorway from Manchester to get here and stressed it in my head, and it did something to me. So. <laughs> okay. But, um, okay. Great. My, yeah. my my question was yeah. partly about the. I mean, a lot of the um, the teachings of Buddhism are to do with things that we have to take on trust. Yeah. Um, unless we have certain insights that will allow us to see the truth of those um, phenomena. Yeah. So, for those things that we have to take on trust, I mean, how, how do we deal with that? Mm. Okay. Well, I think yeah, well, it's a good question. I think these things are these things are very important. Are things that everyone, many many people struggle with. Uh, what is you know what, how far do you take faith in Buddhism, for example? Is Buddhism a faith religion in the same way as Christianity, for example, is about faith? And these are I think very important questions. Uh, faith is one of the one of the five uh, uh, 
spiritual faculties. Uh, I don't know if you, how much you know about the, the Buddhist teachings, but the, okay, it is, it is one of the five spiritual faculties. So it actually exists in Buddhism as well. Uh, but sometimes it is better translated as confidence rather than faith, uh, because it is different from faith in Christianity. It is often based on the sense that you feel that this is right, that you've tried it out for yourself, uh, you've seen some of the benefits of meditation, some of the benefits of living a moral life, and then once you see the benefits, uh, it encourages you, yeah, and you kind of do, do more of it as a consequence. But in Buddhism, it is not, you know, when you are confronted with rebirth, it's not as if you have, from now on, you have to say, yeah, I believe in rebirth because I'm a Buddhist. It's not like that. When you are confronted with rebirth, if you cannot accept it, if you find it difficult to deal with that, then that is fine. Yeah, You're not, you don't have to force yourself to believe in something that you can't believe in. But what I, what I, what I do recommend is that, and what for me is so powerful, I've been reading uh, the Buddha's teachings for 20 years, I've been kind of, you know, studying them in the original language, translating these things and all these kind of things. Uh, and as you get to get a feel for who the Buddha was uh, and what he taught, you start to get a respect for this person. You start to feel this person actually was pretty uh, I was going to say damn, can I say damn? It was pretty exceptional, mm -hmm. yeah, it was very exceptional. Uh, and uh, once you get that feeling, this person actually is very exceptional, uh, you start to also look at the possibility that those things that you cannot accept actually may be true after all. Uh, and this is how gradually you come, about, come around to things like rebirth. Initially, they may seem very strange and very alien to our kind of Western idea of thinking about things. Uh, Actually, there's lots of people in the Western world who believe in rebirth already. Actually, a very vast quantity of people who are Christian, people who are atheists, people who are agnostic, people who are Muslims, yeah, whatever. People believe in rebirth everywhere. Uh, but uh, this is the way you do that. You come to it gradually. Then you think about it. Then you read some of the alternative evidence that may be around. There's lots of interesting evidence that comes out from uh, you know, various fields of science, for example, that I would say are supportive of the idea of rebirth. Yeah. Yeah, and once you once you start looking at these things, and then gradually you move in one direction or the other one, and if ultimately you decide to reject it, okay, so be it. Uh, you, you know, you can't do anything about that. Uh, but if you move in the direction of, uh, if you are committed to the Buddhist teachings, uh, I think there's a very often a great chance you actually eventually you will come around to the idea of rebirth as well, and actually start to see it as a at least a plausible way of looking at the world and the way the world functions. Uh, does that answer your question even remotely? I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Okay, good. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Can I add to uh, that everyone who asked uh, is, uh, about the rebirth? Yeah, some people will have an issue. Yeah. But uh, in what I believe, I'm not believe, I think Buddha is also said, don't believe in a rebirth if you don't want to. Yeah. But it's a cause and effect. So there is a cause, and because of that, there is an effect. So yeah. the cycle. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sure, it's it's all cause and effect. I mean, the Buddhist teaching, one of the kind of main things about it is it is uh, the principle of causality is kind of the, one of the main aspects of Buddhism. Uh, everything in the world is precisely comes about because of causes, uh, and that is one of the consequences of the idea of non-self. Because uh, the idea is that if there is something in the world that is permanent, uh, yeah, whether it is a creator god or it is a soul or whatever it is, then obviously that is not subject to causes and any conditions. That is kind of free of that of that whole idea, yeah, that whole kind of outlook. Yeah. But if you remove that idea of it being something permanent, that everything is bound up in this network of causes and conditions. Uh, and this is kind of one of the most uh, you know fundamental things, the fundamental outlook of Buddhism really. Dependent origination, one of the most profound teachings of the Buddha, is precisely about cause and effect and how you know the uh, the suffering is kind of perpetuated through cause and effect. But uh, I don't think the Buddha said quite that, you know, if you don't want to be, believe in rebirth, then, you know, that's fine, don't have to believe it. it I don't think he quite put it that way. Uh, I think what he said, what he said, what he said that, well, I have discovered that there is a rebirth. This is the way the world works. This is actually right out of it. If you can't believe it, it actually doesn't really say this anyway, but obviously if you can't believe it, well, you can't. So the answer. But it does say specifically, this is how the world operates. And for me, because I've been a Buddhist for a long time now, actually not that long, only a couple of decades, but anyway, for a while, yeah. Uh, for, for me, that is like, you know, what we're talking about, the idea of anecdotal evidence. Yeah, we hear an anecdote, and an anecdote can have 
various way, depending on who tells it anecdote. If there's somebody you trust really highly, and they tell an anecdote, this has happened to me, you will open your ears, you will listen to them. But if someone who's kind of known for fake news, then you're not going <laughs> to listen to them. Yeah? You can say, okay, whatever, you know, it's just more fake news. For me, when the Buddha says that there is rebirth, this is the highest kind of what I would call anecdotal evidence. Someone has had an experience. This is the most believable person I can think of in the human history, basically. I'm going to have to take it seriously. Otherwise, I, I, I feel like a fool if I don't take it seriously. So this is where I, where I look at it. For me, that is the most important evidence of, of this. Thing. There is much more, but that's the one that matters. So can I ask you, Because the best, number one, this is it. Yeah, this is the meaning of life. That's why. That's, why I call it. that's one one way of looking at it. Not, there's no way of looking at it, and this is uh, that's kind of the the ideal way. Yeah, the kind of the, you think that yeah, you have really got it right. Yeah, you are kind of you are smart. You kind of have the right teaching. All this. It's kind of flattered my own ego a little bit. Yeah, but the, the truth, of course, is also it's never as simple as that. Yes, I have kind of discovered the truth and all that. It's never as simple as that. I. One of the things I remember when I was a child, I was 12 years old, yeah, and I had this idea in my mind of living in a small hut in the forest by myself. Where does that come from? How come, as a small child, you have this idea it would be really cool to live in a hut in the forest by myself? It's one of those inexplicable things. You don't really know why it happened, but it happened to me. And now, when I think back, I think very likely it must be because I was a Buddhist monk in the past life. I did actually live in the hut in the forest. I had a sense of desire and attachment towards that. Remember, certain desires and attachments are good. Yeah, don't, don't forget this. Some attachments are bad, some are good. Attached to a, cute, a hut in the forest, it's a good attachment. Yeah, <laughs> this is an important one to remember. You have to get your attachments right and your desires right. Uh, so this was one of the things that happened to me. And then later on, when I kind of I went to university, I studied engineering in Norway. And uh, then I uh, wanted to go to Asia. I always had this desire to go to Asia. I was really interested in Asia for some reason. Nobody in my family was interested in Asia. Actually, my father traveled a lot as a businessman, but nobody in my family was really particularly interested in Asia. So I went to Asia on this exchange program. I came across Buddhism for the first time. I read my first book on Buddhism. This is interesting. Yeah, this is this kind of there's something familiar about this. The Eightfold Path, Four Noble Truths. Hmm. It's almost as if it kind of kindles a memory from some somewhere deep inside of you. You don't know what it is. Eh? And then when I after that trip to this was in Japan, I went to Japan. I saw some monasteries there, all these kind of things. The large Buddha statues and all this. Eh? Kind of scary. Eh? This large Buddha statues when I see them for the first time, they're kind of scary because it's just so overpowering when you see them. I reckon we should have smaller Buddha statues, that's what I reckon. That's a, it's a bit of a side issue, but uh, it's funny. <laughs> so I came back to Norway, and then one of my, one of my very best friends at university, he gave me a book, he said, here, read this book. He said, okay, whatever. And this book was called The Calm Technique. It was about mindfulness of breathing. Yeah, how to practice breath meditation. I tried it. I thought, wow, this is really cool. I got some good results pretty much straight away. And uh, I thought, this is really good stuff. And then I continued on with my, my studies. All of this, where does it come from? Yeah? Well, how did we, all of these kind of things come together? I continued on my studies. I had a bit of a miserable time. I was studying in London after that. Uh, I was studying finance and all things in London. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine that. That's not very, at least for me, it wasn't the right thing. Some people may enjoy that. Uh, and then I thought, I was much happier when I was just meditating by myself and I'm studying finance. Uh, all these people I'm studying with, they don't really share my values at all. They, they want to kind of, work their butts off and make him some money. I'm not really all that interested in that, to be honest. So uh, I went to my first monastery. Then. I called up the Buddhist society in London and said, where are the monasteries? And they kind of, <laughs> that's what, pretty much what I did, actually. And they said, well, go here, go there. And that's how my whole path started. Then. But I think when I look at the overall evidence there, I think the reason I'm a Buddhist monk now is not because I'm particularly clever here. It's not because I've actually found the meaning of life. It's because I probably was a Buddhist monk in the past. It's a bit embarrassing to have to admit that, uh, yeah, I'm just kind of following a pattern, uh, I'm following ancient habits, doing exactly the same thing over and uh, over. That is what we are like, uh, we tend to follow, ha follow habits and patterns. Uh. But of course, in the process, I did discover that, to me, this really is about the meaning of life. Uh, and that, of course, is very important, because that comes on top of the ancient habit. Uh, and then it becomes a very powerful thing that you do, uh, and you keeps you uh, keeps you going in life. Uh. And the most, one of the most difficult things on the Buddhist path, yeah, for all of you here, if you are meditators or whatever, is to really commit to the practice. 
and to persevere with it. And yeah, this is often the most difficult thing. Yeah. And this is the thing I often tell people is talk about how do you commit to the practice? How do you persevere? Yeah. And first of all, uh, the most important thing to commit to uh, is kindness. Uh, that's the most important thing because that is the basis upon which everything else is built. Uh. And how do you commit fully to kindness? Well, the way to commit fully to kindness uh, is that you have to keep on uh, um, keep on getting access, having access to good spiritual teachings. Uh, yeah, that remind you all the time of the importance of these things. Uh. Otherwise, you get dragged away. Other things in life become more important, and you forget about them. Uh. Have access to good spiritual teachings. Uh, if you like, if you can read a little bit of the word of the Buddha, do so. Uh, you get some kind of good uh, uh, talks on YouTube or wherever else it is. Uh, use that to kind of inspire you, to remind you of what is important in life. It is so easy to get sidetracked. Uh, it is so easy to kind of start losing perspective in life. Uh, we all need with all the support we can uh, to be able to persevere and commit what we have. Yes, sir. On, on the topic of rebirth. Yes, please. Yeah, this is uh, a popular topic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah similar yeah. to what you're, you're saying, you, you're saying uh, that um, like you got you got that vision about uh, the, the hookers in the woods from rebirth. Um, so my question is, what what is it that's passed over in rebirth, and what's what is and what isn't? Well, is the mind continuing? Yeah, yeah the mind continues uh, from one life to the next one. Uh, and it is no different from what happens to you now in this life. Uh. So what is happening, you know, if you look at yourself 10 years ago compared to who you are now, uh, uh, you, you would say that you are, uh, there is something happening, there's something that has gone across, there's some similarity between the person you were 10 years ago and who you are now, and there's also a difference. Uh. And that thing, which is kind of both changing and also has a certain degree of similarity to it, uh, that's what you call a stream of consciousness in Buddhism. Uh. Yes, yeah, so the stream of consciousness is this uh, changing stream of the mind. Mind is always moving. It's a bit like you, like the metaphor of a river. Uh, if you imagine a river, a river, the shape, the overall shape of the river is basically it doesn't change very much from one moment to the next one, uh, even from one hour to the next one. Uh, but over long periods of time, the shape of the river will change depending on the amount of rain, yeah, depending on the amount of the temperature, all these kind of things. Uh. In the same way, you will not change dramatically from one moment to the next one. Uh, but if you look over a large number of years, you are gradually changing. Uh. At the same time, if you look very closely at, at that river, uh, you will realize no, mo no two moments are exactly the same. Uh. Yeah, every moment, the molecules are kind of passing. You look one moment later, there's a new molecule, new H2O there in that, in that river. Uh, and the actual, it's changing rapidly all the time. Uh, but the overall shape is kind of uh, similar over long periods of time. Uh. And this is like that. The mind is this, uh, it's not an entity, it's not a permanent thing. It's a process that is always changing in the same way as it is changing in this life, in the same way it is changing, moving from one life to the next one. Uh, people often think that to be able to have rebirth, you have to have some kind of entity that goes across. Yeah? It implies the idea of a soul. That is exactly what the Buddha does not imply the idea of a soul. Uh, all that implies is this process uh, that is fueled by craving and hindered by delusion uh, and that process is what uh, uh, then drives you from one life to the next one you don't actually need any permanent entity for that process to work uh. this is the prof this is actually part of the profoundest insight of buddhism yeah this is what it's actually uh, it's uh, it's kind of hard to get get off of that's where, where the, you know, that good karmas yeah that's where you lead it to the next life yeah Whatever the 
the matter please go down. Mm. He says, Sir, what are you saying? Mm. Obviously, the paper yeah. will go down. Yeah. That's what he's handed. Yeah. So the guy has explained. Yes, my friend. Similarly, yeah. if your father has done good things, yeah. it will flow. If your father has done bad things, yeah. it has to drop. Yeah. So yeah. That's the nature. Yeah. That's yeah. A, yeah, that's similarly found in the Gama de Sangita and Sangita de Kaya. Yeah, yeah. So it's a very, it's a very well-known simile for, for that thing. So pray, praying, if some of them bad it, it's not going to make much difference. Yeah, you can pray as much as you like. Cause and effect. And, uh, cause and effect. Yeah, that's the idea of karma. But um, yeah, yes, please. Isn't one of the, the um, going back to Donald Trump unfortunately? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. One of the functions. When is he coming? Well, he's coming soon, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Reassure us that when people seem to be getting away with it, that there's going to be some retribution later on. And does that yeah. lead then to a kind of shadow side of possible passivity? You know, that could the could the middle way be that the, uh, the you know the the recognised we we work with our mm. anger towards certain people, but also we take appropriate action in order to protect mm. perhaps or very. Yeah. You know, show our disagreement with yeah. what they're trying to do in the world, because that that sense of um, there's going to be some there's going to be consequences down the line in the next life yeah. can kind of postpone everything in a way. I mean, my understanding is that yes. that is that is one understanding of how rebirth kind of mm. that, you know don't think how rebirth kind of emerged as a particular thing. I mean, look, you know, people t- you know. You know, really good people seem to have terrible things happen to them. Yeah. Really bad people seem to yeah. have good things. So how do we reconcile? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I think that. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Getting too excited about front then. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the um, uh, I, 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 I see what you mean, but I, I don't think really that necessarily follows. Yeah. So yes, sure. Okay, Trump may may have some kind of bad record. You know, not, it's not really retribution, it's just a causal consequence of doing bad things. Yeah. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't do anything about it, because you know, obviously the actions of one person like that, they affect lots of people. Huh? So if we have compassion, if we believe that what he's doing is wrong, and some people don't think so, but if you think so, huh? then of course you do something because you think it's bad, yeah? you think it has negative consequences. Huh? You do it out of compassion for the world, not to hurt one person specifically, but out of compassion for everyone else. Huh? Yeah. It's the same thing with a criminal. You may have compassion for a criminal. Maybe they've done the crime for you know for what for them were good reasons, but you still put them to jail to try to rehabilitate them, get them back on track again. Yeah. So sometimes we you have to make take action, regardless of what the law comes up. So that's kind of on top of everything else. So you have to be sensible about things. You can't really use the law comma as a kind of excuse or or you know as a as a way of getting away from you know live, doing the right thing in the world. One of the things that often happens as well, this is quite common in more traditional uh, Buddhist societies, is this idea if someone is reborn, say, handicapped, severely handicapped, for example, yeah? And then people say, well, it's because of their bad karma in the past, yeah? And then they lose the compassion for the person because of a, a, a kind of justification for why they are like that. Again, that is a very wrong way of using the idea of karma. Because we have all been in that situation before, we may all be there again in the future if we have an idea of rebirth. Uh, and because it, things kind of tend to go up and down in waves, uh, they happen to be a little bit down now, and before you know it, you are down, and if, then, then they are up, and we're always changing around like that. Uh, so this is, the, again, the wrong idea. We have to use the idea of a common rebirth in a way which uh, doesn't destroy so much of the positive aspect of the practice, which precisely is uh, compassion and kindness to the people of people around us. So, so uh, yeah. So no, I think you, you know, I think you can. Uh, uh, yeah. So, but you have a point. But so you have to be careful in thinking about these things in the right way. Huh? And then they become forces for good rather than forces to to stop us from doing what is right. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I can't, I mean, I've never had a traumatic experience, but I just can't explain.
saying what yeah. you're today telling. Yes, so yeah. It could yeah. be something that has been passed on. Yeah, it can very well be something that's passed on. And uh, what is interesting about that is that often our habit patterns are very deep seated there. Yeah, and this is also kind of also frightening in a sense. If you have an idea of rebirth and you know that, if, for example, you're very prone to anger, for example, as a person, that, that pattern, habit pattern will tend to replicate itself into the future life unless you do something about it now. And of course, strong anger, very often, it can lead you really far astray. It can end up doing really bad things if, you have, if your anger is completely out of control. So it is, and then the circumstances in, in your present life may be good, maybe you have you know, something that controls and holds back your anger, you don't actually express it so much, but suddenly the circumstances change, yeah. Somebody says you should become a jihadist, for example, yeah? And imagine the combination of being a jihadist and having anger, it's a pretty, usually a pretty bad combination. Or you, you get reborn in a mafia family and they say it's good to kind of, you know, do bad things, yeah. So this is the thing, it depends on the circumstances around you are, are very much will decide how those defilements actually come out in you. And that is kind of frightening. Yeah, it's all cause and conditions. And once you realize that, you realize that now I have the opportunity to kind of de do something with those defilements, to reduce them, to ensure that those habit patterns don't replicate themselves endlessly into the future. Yeah, yeah I, there's a very nice story. I don't know how much time we have. We're probably running out of time. Usually we run out of time very quickly. Ten but, minutes. Uh, ten minutes, okay. It's a nice story. You want to hear a story? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I tell a story. So, okay. So, this is a story about one of the, uh, because I live in Perth in Australia, and we have a very nice Buddhist society down there. And we have one of the members of the Buddhist society does past life regression. You heard about past life regression? Yeah. And uh, one of the members of our Buddhist society, he went to him and he said, okay, I'd like to do a past life regression. He was a Catholic originally, and now he was kind of gradually becoming a Buddhist. Uh, but he didn't believe in rebirth and all that kind of rubbish. You know, you might hear the word rebirth rubbish. Many people think like that. Yeah. So he went to this past life regressionist and then he uh, sat down with him and, and, you know, he was hypnotized and all these kind of things. And then he started remembering things from something was coming out of him that he didn't know what was coming from. And he was talking about this past life experience with an enormous amount of detail. He remembered being a very poor man from Ireland who then kind of emigrated from Ireland and to, to Australia, started a new life of in Australia, building up a, a large farm in the south, uh, southwest corner of, uh, of Australia, uh, being very proud of his work, uh, having a wife with such and such a name, himself having such and such a name, having children such and such. His farm looked like this. Uh, he had this kind of employment before he started on the farm. Lots of details, seeing the colors of his boots, that kind of thing, uh, through this, uh, this imagery. Uh, and then he, when he then eventually passed away in this uh, past life uh, uh, regression uh, uh, or experience, uh, he was very proud of himself. Yeah, I came from Ireland, had two empty hands, I was destitute where I came from, and I built all this up for myself. Uh, and it's natural that you should feel a bit of pride in that. Yeah, you have really kind of made something out of your life. You started with nothing. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, after he came out of this, uh, he didn't want to hear about it because he didn't believe in rebirth. He would have nothing to do with it. So after a month, he decided to go back to this. The impression was so powerful, he couldn't get rid of it. He went back to this regression, uh, regressionist, uh, tried it one more time, more details coming out. Yeah. And as gradually he started to process these things that were happening, he realized that he had to look into this. Where were there actually such a person who did migrate to Australia? Did this person exist? He had so much information, it would be quite easy to go to the registry of immigrants or whatever and find out. And of course, as he started to research this, he found a person who matched him almost perfectly. Yeah, he went down to the farm that he was supposed to have to kind of look for the farm if it matched with all these things. And what happened was that gradually over time, he said he was forced to believe in rebirth. For him, it was such an incredibly powerful experience, although he was absolutely sure beforehand that it wasn't right, uh, there was no rebirth, now he was forced to do it. Uh, but that was only part of the thing. What was most uh, in, important to him was not that. Uh, what was most important to him was that in this life, he was a very successful uh, uh, businessman. He started his own company. He was doing some kind of software for the mining industry. Uh, everything is mining industry down there in Western Australia, where we live, 90% uh, uh, anyway. Uh, doing some software for the mining industry, uh, uh, built up a multi-million dollar company, uh, was very proud of himself again. Yeah, 
I have done this with my own two, uh, with my own two hands, building up from scratch, uh, working really hard, and now I have kind of made a good life for myself. Uh. But then, when he had this past life experience, uh, he realized he had exactly the same personality in the past life. Yeah, he was a farmer who built everything up with his two hands. Uh. In this life, all he was doing, he was like a robot running on the same program that he had already built up in the past life. Now he was still being successful, not because he actually wanted particularly to be successful, but because he was doing things out of habit. He had done this in the past, now he was doing it again. He was like a robot running on a program. And this program, he just, he, there was no way to know when this program had been written. Probably not in the last life, probably a long, long time before that. And you keep on doing the same thing again and again and again. It feels like you are doing it. It feels like this is your intention and your purpose. But actually, that's only an illusion. This is what the illusion of self is all about. You're doing it not because you want to do it, because you are compelled to do it. And that is when you feel, whoa, I don't want to do this anymore. You feel trapped. Yeah, this is the, this is the feeling you get there. You feel trapped by cause and conditions. And he said at that moment, he just wanted to quit his job, sell everything and become a monastic. Because you realize that actually I'm trapped by this personality, by this habit, by what I've been doing in the past. And this is what I mean when I said before that uh, uh, we are trapped by our habits and the, you know, the defilements that we have, the character traits that we have that are negative. We carry them on from one life to the next one without realizing what is going on and they are a trap. We are held by this and then when given the wrong kind of conditions in the future, then we will play itself out in the wrong way and it will become a massive problem as a consequence. To me, that was a very powerful story because I started to realize the problem of rebirth, the problem of conditioning, and what is actually happening there. Yeah. So uh, anyway, yeah, so that's a little story for you. But, <laughs> so uh, one more. Yes, please, 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 sir. Yeah. So yeah, I've had a similar feeling. I've been trapped and feeling drawn to monasticism, but I've already made commitments in this life to marriage and children. Yeah. Um, so how do I, do you have any advice for reconciling that? Um, and say like my wife wants to build a big extension, um, yeah. you know, watch <laughs> lots of exciting yeah. sort of TV dramas and, you know, so kind of, and, and, and obviously then I'm kind of pulled into that yeah. by yeah. proxy, you know, and, and kind of find myself kind of living out some of these um, desires and, and, you know, kind of aware of that and mm. sort of, you know, trying to, invest my, my energy in a wise way but as a yeah. lay person who's already made that commitment but is um, kind of drawn to monasticism but then I can't do that because yeah. I've already uh, you know, yeah. signed yeah, up yeah. to this kind of uh, existence now I mean yeah. how, how would you any, I, any advice? I wouldn't worry too much about it you know these are the natural things of living in the world you enjoy certain entertainments you have to feel the extension of the houses you know this is what happens in the world uh, uh, and uh, so it, what is important is how it affects your mind and as long as it doesn't affect your mind in a terrible way uh, you don't end up becoming an ogre or angry person or anything like that but you are able to stay with your kindness and compassion and understanding uh, you're able to kind of do your meditation practice with it be interested in that uh, mm -hmm. as long as you're able to have still have a balanced life uh, these things are not to be to be to be too concerned about uh, in the end, the way you decide anything in life, the way you make any choice, is to ask yourself, how is it going to affect my practice? How is it going to affect my life? And if it's going to affect your life in a positive way, that is going to increase your good qualities and decrease your bad qualities, that is usually how you make your decisions. So, mm -hmm. so if this, in this case, you have to compromise a little bit. And if because, you know, because of your position, mm -hmm. if it doesn't, isn't going to have a very bad consequence on you, then it's okay. If your wife says, I want you to go out stealing things, well, that, that is when you have a real problem, yeah? Mm -hmm. That is when you have to kind of stand your ground and say, actually, I don't really want to do that. Or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're most welcome. Uh, we should, okay, we should. I, I hear from over here, we should. I don't think I know what that means. Uh, so, uh, okay. Very good. Huh? Uh, last, any last urgent minute question that anyone wants to ask you? No? Yes. Okay, last one. Okay. I read this um, super. What have I seen you before? I, I was from the, the BGF. Oh, BGF, yeah, okay. I thought I recognized you. Yeah. Um, yeah. My, my uncle's Eddie, by the way. <laughs> Your uncle is? Uh, it's Eddie. Eddie. <laughs> Eddie. 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 Eddie Cohen. Eddie Cohen. Eddie cool. Eddie cool, of course. Cool, yeah. Of course I know Eddie. Yeah, he's your uncle. Okay, that's what you're Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So yeah. I read this uh, super number two in Majima Kaya. It yeah. says, um, do not attend. Uh, there are 
things that lead to unwholesome things. Yeah. Uh, attending to certain topics like what am I, what was I in the past, yeah. what am I in the future, and those kind of things. Yeah. And I, I didn't look into past life in that, but I personally yeah. I thought that like looking into your past in in terms of this present life, yeah. you see how you're conditioned in a certain way. Then you can let let go of certain attachments by oh. by by clearly seeing like the links, mm. links between what has happened in the past and um how how you your your habit and and tendencies yeah. tend to behave in yeah. the present. Yeah. Um. So, but it says in the sutta that you shouldn't yeah. attend to those things. Yeah. Yeah. And what 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 was the spirit of? Am I reading it's, it wrong? It's it's different because what that sutta is talking about is the sense of self and the, your sense of identity. So the idea there is who was I in the past? It's assuming that you were an identity who was transmigrated from one life to the next one. Yeah. You're looking at it from a position of a of a self. Uh, looking at your past life is different because actually what you're trying to do here is trying to understand life in a different way, trying to actually get insight into life, to understand what is going on. Uh, whereas the other person is actually trying to under, to kind of justify their, their sense of self and, and who they are as a person and how this kind of person has kind of practiced, gone through uh, gone through samsaric existence. Uh, one is a reaffirmation of the sense of self, uh, the other one undermines the sense of self ultimately and then you see through it. Uh, one is about insight, the other one is about uh, like holding on to something which it doesn't actually exist. That is what that thing is. And it can seem similar, but you have to kind of uh, read the subtleties into these things and actually understand that they are they're actually quite different. Yeah. yeah. As long as you don't read into it to boast your kind of ego, kind of... As, as long as you don't read it as a sense of, as a real self, a, a, a self existing entity which passes on from one life to the next one, that is where you have to be careful. That is the problem. But if you haven't got the if you haven't got the teaching about non self, that's what you will do automatically. Yeah. You will see your past lives. You will say, oh yeah, I was like that in the past. Now I'm like this. Yeah. But because of the Buddha, you know, the Buddha's teaching tells you that well, actually, uh, yes, you were there in the past, but it's not the same you as you are now. You have changed, just like you change in this life. But you also change between lives. So you look at the whole thing in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think I'm not. I'm. I'm just kind of supposed to be the slave and give the talk, so I will pass the word over to Venerable Chanda, who's really in charge. Yeah? Is that, is that right? Um, <laughs> nobody's in charge. <laughs> Can use the microphone? No. no? no. no? I mean, okay. I think just to thank everybody for being here tonight, and yeah. uh, especially to Ajahn Vamali for offering a lovely Dhamma talk again, even after seven days of intensive teachings. I think you just got the summary, so maybe next time people can come <laughs> to the retreat. We hope to have you back again. And um, yeah, and outside now there'll be an opportunity to offer donations if anybody wishes. Everything um, tonight will be going towards Anukampa Bikuni project, which is something I'm heading in England to try to establish um, a practice monastery for women. So this is a place where women will be able to come and actually take the full training towards Bikuni ordination. Um, hopefully we'll have it in a forest, although England's not a huge country like Australia, but hopefully we'll have some forest there. I saw lots of forest today. I was driving with your, your dad when we oh, saw forest. Right. Yeah. Chatsworth. Yeah, Chatsworth area. We can, we can have there. Chatsworth. <laughs> we can talk to them. Now, that is ambition. That's, yeah, okay. Good. I'm glad you are, glad you are ambitious. That's really nice. Yeah, yeah. So there'll be an opportunity to donate. Um, there's some little leaflets as well about what we're trying to do. And also... Um, some of the people supporting the project are the Grantwood Buddhist Society and they've made some little um, books that are available also outside, um, which are just some kind of uh, little teachings that Ajahn Brahmali has given. We've just taken some little quotes from some of his talks and uh, made them into a book, so they're available too. So thank you very much for coming and, uh, yeah, hope to be back in Sheffield at some point and maybe, yeah teach and I also want to thank River who's um, from the Sheffield Insight group okay right so all of you came from the Sheffield Insight because you lent us the cushions they lent us the cushions for the retreat uh -huh, okay. so because of that we all had a very comfortable abiding I think without the cushions we'd have been kind of creaking into the room tonight so thank you very much it was you know we created like this mini Dhamma hall and it became a very nice atmosphere and energy there so very conducive for practice so thank you very much for your support too. Yeah. Thank you. Very good. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good. good and, uh, yeah. The reason I'm in charge is because we do have like everywhere we go at the moment we have to hire the place, so we have higher hours. And if we stay, then 
yeah, either we get kicked out or we get charged for that. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, to avoid both. <laughs> we'll be outside anyway if you want to have a word, but we should probably move out of this hall. So we're here, okay. okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm happy yeah. to have this outside. Yeah, yeah. yeah. great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.